Hello, you're watching the Telecom TV Summit on the Green Network and our panel discussion on energy efficiency targets for new infrastructure. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. When sourcing new infrastructure equipment, what emphasis should telcos place on energy consumption and efficiency? And what work is still required to ensure that energy efficient infrastructure is available to all telcos, great and small? Well, with the help of our guests, we are going to find out. And joining me today are Irene Zhang, who is Director Product Marketing, Cloud Metra and Security at Juniper Networks. Beth Cohen, who is SDN Product Strategies at Verizon. Mark Gilmore, CTO for Connectivity Europe. And Toyo Ebigbi, who is VP Innovation and Strategy Energy at American Tower. Hello, everyone. Very good to see you all. Thanks so much for taking part in our discussion. So how important is energy efficiency as a criteria for selecting new infrastructure and equipment, not just in the power hungry radio elements, but throughout the network? How does it stack up against other purchasing criteria? Mark, perhaps we could get your views on this first. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, actually, this is really, really pertinent to, to us right now uh, in connectivity because um, we are building a new company, we're building a new network. Uh, and so this is um, first and foremost in, in our thoughts. Um, I suppose my first point to note is we're building out a, uh, a, a new data transport network for you know, uh, across um, international borders. Uh, one of the things we've been um, focused on is first of all, you kind of look at the, the, the functionality and the capability um, of, uh, of network equipment, vendors, etc. But then very quickly, we're looking at the environmental impact, um, the energy efficiency, um, for example, and that's twofold. One from our own ESG sort of targets and our, and our, our, our function really, I suppose, as a new company coming new in, into, into the industry and you know, new into the into the, the global industry as such. Um, so we've got that on, on one side, but also um, there is a cost implication. There is a cost, there is a uh, an op operating cost uh, point to that. And so really we're looking at it twofold. Um, first of all, we've got to nail the, the form, the functionality um, and, and capability, and then it becomes very quickly a, uh, a, a criteria selection for us in terms of power efficiency for cost and to also meet our own uh, ESG policies and targets that we're setting. Thanks, Mark. That sounds like it's encouragingly high up the agenda there. Beth, um, from Verizon's perspective, you know, are, are we seeing energy efficiency as, as one of the, the key purchasing criteria now? Absolutely. It's one of our key uh, purchasing criteria. Uh, you know, we are uh, focus one of our major goals, you know, we have a number of uh, strategic goals and, and part of our mission statement is to be energy efficient and to be, you know, give back to the planet. And that includes, you know, reducing our, our carbon footprint and, and reducing our energy consumption, you know, and, and um, as was previously mentioned, you know, obviously cost affects it as well. Um, but we are looking at, uh, you know, when we look at equipment, we're looking at the, the energy footprint as part of the equation. You know, that goes right into our RFPs. Thank you very much, Beth. And Toyo, what are you seeing here over at American Tower? Absolutely. I think um, uh, the Beth and Mark covered the points quite well. I think the only addition I would add is, you know, we are in an interesting point when you think about the cloudification of the networks, uh, the rise of data consumption in significant uh, amounts. If you look at the average consumption per user a couple of years ago, maybe it was about two to three gigabytes per month, and that's hovering north of 30, 40 in some instances. That's driving the need for a lot of power intensity as core customers like uh, mobile network operators deploy 
you know, these five generation or 5G networks uh, across our portfolio. And so when you couple that with the key points that I've mentioned earlier, which are cost and also the need to become greener and more sustainable, you've got this perfect um, uh, situation where the need for energy efficiency all across the value chain of telecommunications infrastructure becomes more poignant and pertinent than it's ever been you know, in my career in telecoms. Well, wow, that's that, that's great. Thanks very much, Toyo. And uh, Irene, um, from the the vendor perspective, you give us a different perspective on this. Um, are, are you seeing the requirements for energy efficiency increasing? Absolutely. So um, for RFP, energy efficiency has always been um, there for the past five ten years. However, in the past, that is more of a checklist item. But what we see over the last two three years it actually becomes a critical criteria where if the vendor is not providing specific numbers then even though the overall solution may be even cheaper or have lower cost of ownership it will still not proceed to the next step for the the bid process thanks irene um, in fact i'd like to stay with you now because i want to i want to ask whether or not you're seeing um well Let's look at different hardware. We, we have lots of different hardware in our networks. They're all different hardware. We've got different energy requirements. But do we collectively have an, an agreed level of power usage for new equipment? You know, do we as an industry put a figure on this yet? Um, from what we see, we haven't seen like an agree upon number yet. And in fact, I would argue that it's it really needs to have a number for uh, same category. So we can't compare apples to orange. And an analogy that I like to use is when we think about home, let's say a smart home, you have different appliances. Same thing that in your network infrastructure, you have different equipment across different domains. And when you look at each individual equipment, so let's say in your home, your refrigerator versus your TV versus your coffee makers, those are just by default, they are going to consume different levels of energy. So putting a same number uh, to to them would not make sense. Now, it makes sense when you are comparing, let's say, refrigerator versus refrigerator from different vendor or TV versus TV, right? So that is um, how we see that. And it would make sense moving forward to have the industry to have some agree upon number uh, for the same category of solutions. Yeah, so we could do the number, but we've got to make sure this is category specific. Thanks, Irene. Uh, Mark, what are your views on this? Um, well, Irene's cor absolutely correct in that the, there isn't a kind of like a, a standard that I can look to and say, yep, that I can tick against that. Um, what we have seen, for example, though, is sometimes um, vendors are trying to use um, comparative statements like um, or, or trying to trying to um, put in sort of sort of relative scale um, cost uh, sorry power per bit is used in, in in that but you know those can be misleading um, be it, if I look for example um, at the the network that we're building if I was to build that on on equipment that was say 10 years old or five years old um, using that generation of equipment then the cost per bit or the power per bit um, would be co considerably higher. Um, actually, look, we've done some studies looking at it. For example, uh, the reduction level can be as much as 85% in terms of the power consumption per bit transported. However, the that only comes into play when the equipment is fully utilized. Um, and uh, otherwise, that, that power per bit um, figure can can really ramp up very quickly if the the network is not being fully utilized uh, at that point. So there's 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 attempts being made, but uh, but it's still not we're not there in terms of having a clear guidance, clear way of of looking at it um, uh, comparatively and robustly, um, and I think verifiably. Um, I've in my uh, studies on this in my learning on this you know I've come across this term investor grade um, carbon accounting and um, 
yeah, I think that's difficult to get to. I'm, I'm used to the carrier grade sort of approach. Well, you know, there's this accountability side of it as well. Oh, very interesting, Mark. Uh, we, we've always got to read the small print very, very carefully here as to as to um, what we're actually getting. Um, Beth, let's come across to you for, for some thoughts on this. Yeah, I'd like to to address it a little more broadly. You know, I, I'm very familiar with the, you know, in the US, we have the Energy Star system, you know, which, you know, when you go into a store and you, you see an array of refrigerators, each one has a has a number, you know, the average the average amount of money you'll spend on on uh, you know this appliance running and uh, that would be great if we could get to that with you know with the telco um, support infrastructure um, however I think um, it's a little more difficult um, because it's not a unit right um, you know the infrastructure is yeah there's there's you know, there's server boxes, which are virtualized, you know, running virtualized services. And obviously the cloud is, gener you know, is has reduced the carbon footprint, print correct, um, you know, significantly. And as Mark mentioned, it's all about being efficient, right? That's, that's what, you know, that virtualization trend really was all about, you know, reducing the amount of, of idle spinning disks and idle and idle um, CPUs. And, um, so that that's just one aspect of it but you know any, anybody who's familiar with how data centers work know that the majority of the power is spent on cooling um the the you know the systems and and so uh i think there's a lot of things that need to be um looked at and optimized to get to that power per bit um, and then be able to standardize across the industry. So, you know, that that's where I think the standards bodies really need to step in uh, to, you know, as an industry a, across the industry to, to work together to create those standards and to and to create the, the mechanisms for reducing those footprints. OK, thanks very much, Beth. And Toyo, did you want to come in on this particular talking point as well? Sure. I mean, Beth just actually hit the point that, that was uh, resonating with me, which is the, the value chain. Uh, I like the, the fact that she emphasized, you know, cooling being a you know, core component for, you know, cloud networks or data center operations. And so as we think about and 3GPP, the standards body for telecommunications, uh, you know, networks, as you will today, has done a fantastic job with you know thinking about energy efficiency from a radio access network perspective but the point that i think was very poignant and i think both mark and, and beth hit on this is as you think about the entire value chain if you think about the energy star it, it looks at scope emissions and it looks at you know all the different component parts that go into making a refrigerator or a television and i think we need to start you know evolving to that um paradigm within tele tele telecommunications where we start thinking about, you know, what are the cooling uh, requirements and how do the, you know, manufacturers that participate in that space, you know, sync and align with the sustainability and cost efficiency goals that telecommunications networks now require. Thank you very much, Toya. Thanks everyone for, for those comments. Well, we've been focusing so far on hardware for new infrastructure, but is the energy use of software also being considered in the same way as that of hardware infra? Beth, I know the issue of software is very close to your heart. What, what, what do you say? Uh, it, it, the short answer is I don't even think it's on anybody's horizon, but it should be. <laughs> um, because uh, software efficiency, software developers do not think in terms of, oh, if I write this code, it will, it will, you know, reduce the power consumption. Uh, but they, uh, and, and we don't even really have the tools to allow them to even take that into consideration. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. It applies to edge as well. And, and the use of the network more efficiently, which again is going to drive down power consumption, um, to, to make sure that the, the, that you, the software does the work in the appropriate place in the network um, will, you know, reduce the amount of, of, well, it'll reduce the latency, it'll reduce, you know, improve customer experience with the software, but it will also reduce the, the power, you know, the carbon footprint at the same time. And, and I think we just haven't even 
gotten to the starting point at this point with with in that discussion uh you know virtualization is certainly you know a component but um you know from the software developers perspectives it's not even on the roadmap yet thank you beth that's so, you know it's, it's so disappointed to hear from an industry perspective that you know we haven't even got the tools yet to be able to uh, address this mark um what about you do you do you believe the the use of um, energy efficiency in software is being considered in the same way as hardware yet uh, I, I agree with Beth on this one. Um, no, uh, I don't think it's truly being covered just yet. Um, the, there's a slight irony that in the world of virtualization, as we, you know, we Beth mentioned it earlier, you you utilize, you disaggregate the software into hardware, spin down, um, you know, an unused hardware, for example. But then if we've got an inefficient code um, and software that's that's running inefficiently, then taking that power saving that's been made by spinning the hardware down, and then actually the, the software is running in more inefficiently, then essentially you lose that advantage. But I think it's also very much workload uh, dependent. And I think an application, and sometimes we need to be careful as operators as uh, as and users of these services to say, actually, do we really need such power intensive applications or software to do a task um the my example here would be you know ai ml driven um applications you know i think the 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 consideration question that needs to be to be raised there is do i actually really need to ru run ai to do this application or is it something that's kind of good it get, brings a benefit but is actually the benefit outweighed because you're actually having to it's quite a, a power intensive sort of workload. Um, I don't think those questions are being potentially con considered at the moment. Um, and I think that's part of the, the, the ongoing discussion, hence why we have these sort of summits to bring these points up. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Mark. And uh, there's, there's tough decisions there, isn't it? When you when you look at the benefits and you, you've got to you've got to weigh them all up. Um, well, you know, moving on from from software to the cloud, we touched on the cloud earlier in our discussion. Um, as we see more increase in the use of public cloud by telcos, how does this usage affect energy? Um, and in this situation, what control, if any, does a telco have over the, the energy usage, the power usage of power output of, of the cloud providers? Uh, Beth, what, what are your thoughts? So, so sadly, the cloud providers hold all the cards in this regard, because of course, they're running the data centers there. And, and, you know, I will hand them kudos in that they are, in fact, um, cognizant of the, uh, of the the power, their power requirements, and and are you know active in reducing uh, their power needs as much as possible. But the, you know, our interaction as a telco with these with these cloud providers is that we're just consumers of those services, and so we have little or no say in you know in their efficiencies and their power consumption re reduction. Um, our only way that we could possibly affect it is, you know, harking back to the previous question related to software, we, you know, can we write more efficient software that will, you know, has a reduced uh, footprint? And and I think that's our only leverage in, in terms of uh, supporting uh, the reduced power consumption in in with the cloud providers you know obviously we maintain our own data centers uh with our own clouds and and you know within those clouds of course the private clouds we do have control um, but the public clouds we don't no thank you beth uh toyo what's your views about how the increase in public cloud usage is affecting energy usage from telcos I think um, Beth hit, hit the right points in terms of thinking about the fact that the current providers are, are working actively to mitigate their energy uh, consumption. In fact, I read uh, recently one of the big hyperscaler cloud providers uh, decided to run their servers a little hotter to, to reduce you know, the cooling intensity required to, to keep those uh, servers up and running. So those are just some of the techniques that are being used by the cloud providers 
uh, to help increase energy efficiency. I think when you look at it broader, I think w one of the, the key things that I'm seeing is this microcosms of activities taking place towards energy efficiency. I think Mark pointed out, point raised that, alluded to that point earlier, where he mentioned, you know, you, you see power per bit, but the way it's looked within the cloud networks is a little different from the way that a radio access network may look at, you know, the power energy efficiency. And so one of the things that I think we could do is, is really bring some of these key stakeholders together as we think about, you know, the virtualizations of the networks, the cloudification of the telecommunications networks, how we can bring these key stakeholders together to expand the scope of how we currently look at uh, telecoms infrastructure and architecture. And I think by you know, sort of expanding the scope and bringing these key stakeholders that historically have sort of stayed on their, you know, swim lanes of ones and zeros um, can potentially help, you know, increase the overall energy efficiency and performance that we see in telecommunications networks today. Yeah, thanks, Toy. You're, you're absolutely right. We, we, we do this collaboration in order to understand each other and, and the angles, you know, where we all come from. Um, Mark, I'll come to you in a moment, but first um, let's hear from uh, Irene and, and your thoughts on this. Yeah, so um, I agree with Beth that while there are not many controls that Telco have, but I would say in addition to choosing more um, efficient software, uh, another thing to consider is to look at the nature of the application workload and choose the cloud instance that match the, the best with the workload. And that way that also would improve the efficiency, uh, the energy efficiency of, of those application. Because think about it, when you have, let's say fully loaded hardware, if it's same performance, the hardware is almost always high, more efficient than software. And the reason being that you have the processors, the equipment actually optimized to that workload. Now, when it comes to software, those are um, general purpose um, CPU, but if, if you pick certain processors and instance that are actually um, better suited for certain type of application, then you will get closer benefit to as if you are running the, the dedicated hardware. So, so that is another thing to consider. Oh, good point. Thanks very much, Irene, for that. Uh, and Mark, let's uh, hear from you on this issue of, of public cloud use. Thank you. Um, I think if I was being disingenuous, I would say as an operator, it's kind of not my problem because basically I've offloaded that uh, that problem to the public cloud providers and, and it becomes a scope three emission for me. But ultimately, that's not going to solve the general problems that we have. So in reality, what that means is exactly what the what uh, my fellow panelists have kind of um, brought up is we start developing then how we um, utilize uh, power more efficiently in those environments. But as an I'm not in the data center market or space, but it is interesting that the way that data centers are um, and and the cloud is, is sometimes referred to or the new data centers as they come on stream is they're spoken of in terms of their power capability um uh, you know in terms of megawatts in terms of how large a data center it is um and, and that's an ever-increasing scale uh i think one of the the key drivers that needs to happen in that space is actually um, well, renewables are an absolute table stakes for, for, for data center space. And when we are looking to purchase data center space, you know, that's a key criteria we're looking at. Um, going back to the first question, um, really, in terms of what are the data centers providers doing in terms of their supply, even though it isn't a direct uh, impact on my scope one, scope two emissions, it is on scope three and my overall contribution as, a, as an operator into the industry. Um, but uh, the, I think one of the key movements that, that, that is happening and needs to happen is for um, data centers to have direct access to, the, to renewable sources rather than just through the, the grid. Uh, and we, we've seen examples of that starting to come on, come on stream. Uh, and I think that's a critical part of the overall industry becoming more of a, a, a green network. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Mark. And, and we've uh, we heard earlier in the, in the summit about taking responsibility across the whole ecosystem, across all supply chains as well. Um, Beth, uh, let's come across to you for some additional thoughts on this. 
Yeah, I have uh, one more comment, which is that um, I know that the cloud providers, um, and, and I'm thinking of one example of a cloud provider that stood up their data center next to a hydro uh, um, dam. So, you know, so it was cheap, you know, clean energy. Um, unfortunately, it was nowhere near the telco um, networks. Uh, so that data center, um, you know, has has struggled to because of because of its location. So that's something that, um, you know, the telcos are probably more aware of than the than the um, cloud providers about that the the need to have the data centers close to population centers, uh, you know, for latency purposes and for efficiency of the network, um, and that you cannot put a data center in the middle of a place that's not well served by by the telcos. Indeed. Thanks, Beth. It's a complicated uh, set of equations that your telcos have got to work on here to, to, to balance all this up and, and make it work and make it as energy efficient as possible. Um, which brings us on to our last question, really. And we, we've, to an extent, we've covered elements of this earlier, but what work is still required by the industry as a whole to ensure that energy efficient infrastructure is available and not just to a handful of telcos, but to all telcos? Toyo, let me come across to you to start us off, please. Absolutely, and I think you're right to say that a lot of a lot of the the work that needs to be done, we've we've touched on in pockets during the discussion earlier. You know, I'll break it down into three points, at least from my vantage point. I think the first one, you know, really pertains to you know setting standards, holistic standards, and metrics and targets that not just are applicable in microcosms, like we discussed earlier. I think Mark alluded to that, but across the entire ecosystem of telecommunications infrastructure, you know, I think there's nothing more motivating than a North Star to keep key stakeholders working in tandem and in synchronicity to be able to achieve our energy efficiency goals, while also making sure that these um, these solutions that we deploy are you know close to carbon neutral as possible. Uh, because we also have, you know, sustainability targets and ambitions as well. I think the second point is really around the ecosystem or the va the value chain, and you know, you could look at it from a combination of both hardware and software. And because I'm, a, you know, infrastructure uh, supplier to the mobile network operators, I'll, I'll take it from the hardware perspective. And we've seen that, you know, I love the example that Beth you know, mentioned earlier, you know, cooling, for example, being a huge component of the whole power efficiency utilization for data centers. And so being able to think about all the different hardware components that go to supporting the network stack, the network infrastructure, and being able to bring those key providers, vendors, um, uh, suppliers to, to bear so that they all align towards making sure that the systems that we deploy at the edge, you know, at the base station of a macro network or even at the end user device are more energy efficient, more cost effective and overall optimal for our network and ambition needs. And the last one is really around the end user. I think there's a piece that we haven't really covered today in, in this discussion is, there's a proliferation of devices as, as the network expands. You think about 5G, you think about you know, IoT, you think about you know, network of networks, and all that means is more devices, uh, more needs for data, and more needs for energy to help propagate the electromagnetic frequencies that go to those devices, at least wirelessly or even wired vis-a-vis -vis optical networks for, for transport like fiber. And I think what role are, are the you know end user device manufacturers also playing to make those 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 um, phones and computers and 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 uh, sensors more energy efficient, uh, more in tandem with the networks that are being deployed today, such that you know you could have an overall efficient energy infrastructure as you advance and evolve within telecom. So you know it's a combination of those three: the end users, the value chain as well as some of the standards that could drive, you know, the first two that I mentioned, I think will really go a long way in getting us to a more energy efficient telecommunications landscape in the future. Great. Nice summary, Toyo, there. And uh, you're absolutely right about the need for end-to-end like, -end e efficiency across the whole of, of telecoms. Uh, anybody else like to make some final comments on what we can do as an industry to, to improve the situation? Irene, let me come to you. Yeah, so uh, on that question about the making energy efficient 
infrastructure accessible to uh, telcos. I think one thing that we all should think about is change required business case. And for transitioning to energy efficient infrastructure does require investment. So when it comes to business case, it the industry can do, I would say two things. One is for the early adopters that when adopting the energy efficient infrastructure and for different domains, different parts of the network, document them and share what was the before and after in terms of energy savings, um, business outcomes. And those numbers will be tremendously helpful for other telcos to use it as a business case. And second is also consider for the industry standard body to collaborate with government to seek if there's any incentive, uh, maybe even tax credit, something like that, they can help um, operators, uh, perhaps rural operators that make the initial investment easier to get it started. Good points. Thank you, Irene, for those. And we'll go across to Mark as well for, for comments on, uh, on what we can do to make the situation better. One of the interesting things we can do actually is work, is work better together as, as, as an industry. Um, actually in, in um, more efficiently using our networks um, because th there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a baseline power requirement that is run that is required to run a network, um, and it, you know incrementally adding on adding capacity into that, particularly in my space, which is which is the the kind of the wholesale large backhaul um, uh, market, um, so international backhaul market, um, utilizing and maximizing the 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 uh, network capacity in those really makes a. a a powerful difference to the efficiency. Um, I think the other thing that I'd like to bring out is, and we've touched upon it in the session, is is um, real, verifiable, and, and traceable sort of metrics uh, that uh, that can be used. One of the things that I've, uh, as we build our company and as we build our network, is that we're, we're we have aspirations. Well, we had aspirations actually to look to try and be net zero from 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 day one not not achievable one because it's difficult to actually measure and account for that and and also we touched on that scope three sort of um uh, control we just don't have but um but certainly as a company we can be carbon neutral um from day one but that requires very tight and accountable carbon accounting um to be able to um bring that in and as, so these are the measures that we need to bring in and understand across the networks across the industry um and uh, and then feed back in and one of the things that i just i learned from this session actually i think beth mentioned it but interesting to see if we can actually run our equipment at slightly higher temperatures to to reduce down the cooling required i mean that's a conversation for us to have with the um with the uh, with the vendor community, because that could make a significant difference. It certainly could, and it's just another great example of the the innovation that comes out of this industry that we sometimes o overlook that can that can help us in these these situations. And you mentioned you know the the, the problems with measuring and, and monitoring. We had a whole panel session earlier in the summit about that, and it is so incredibly difficult. Now we must leave it there. Thank you all so much for taking part in our discussion today and sharing all of your views. If you're watching this on day three of the Green Network Summit, then please do send us your questions and we'll answer as many of them as we can in our live Q&A show. And that is coming up very shortly. Don't forget to view the other panel discussions and interviews in this year's summit. But for now, thank you for watching and goodbye.